I'm Professor Mark Sims. I'm from the uh, University of Leicester. I'm going to give you a bit of a different uh, talk, obviously into details of software and some of the talks I've listened to. Um, it really is in the context of a mission called Beagle 2, where I was mission manager. Um, and this is an overview of lessons learned in terms of challenges innovation in management, which I think of application elsewhere, not just to space, particular software. I'll talk very briefly about software in this talk. So the contents of the talk are going to be, the ch we're going to talk about challenges, innovation management, risk and failure, which does happen, we like it or not. Briefly going to touch on how space affects our lives today. And then I'm going to talk about recent developments in terms of Beagle 2. So let's start with the challenges. Uh, these are challenges for um, work in space. Uh, it's a very different environment. It's becoming an environment where amateurs can participate in things like CubeSats, NanoSats, etc. And I'm sure at some point uh, maybe people here will get, get involved. So first of all, all, the environment is pretty challenging. You've got vacuum, zero partial gravity. Uh, people are now talking about uh, nanosats, cubesats to places like Mars. Uh, launch, you have to launch the things, vibration and acoustic. And launch, by the way, is the biggest cost driver for people getting into space from an amateur point of view. Um, you have to survive the acoustic load during launch have to survive the thermal extremes you may see, cold when you're not in the sun, hot when you are in the sun, large excursions and rapid timescales. Perhaps more important from the electronics point of view and the software point of view, you're in a pretty harsh radiation environment. You have UV, which will uh, alter your surface coatings. You have X-rays, gamma rays and particles, all of which may cause things like single up event upsets and software glitches. And you have shock as well. If you're a main spacecraft or even a small spacecraft, you'll need to be clamped to the top of the uh, upper stage, and that involves a shock when you're released, and it may involve things like explosive bolts, which can put very high loads into your payload. And reliability, it must work. Um, or you must have redundant systems. Uh, space missions are still extremely expensive. Those are lots of moves I'll talk about later to bring those costs down. Um, and cost is anywhere from tens of millions for instruments on scientific, pay, uh, scientific payloads through to billions of dollars for things like James Webb Space Telescope. But people are now talking about trying to build spacecraft for a few hundred thousand dollars or even less in terms of uh, nanosats. Risk is a big element and risk I'll come back to later. I think it's a key thing which everybody has to recognize and deal with no matter what job you're, you're in, no matter what you're developing. And my philosophy has always been eliminate as much as possible and as soon as possible you can in the development cycle. And then you have the obvious uh, resource limitations, mass, power, volume, data volume, etc. Getting data down from a spacecraft can be actually be a major problem. People are starting to talk about onboard software to process data, um, meaning that you can't then reprocess that data because you may have, may have lost it because you've already processed it. So design engineering principles, I think they're as relevant to software as they are to a piece of space hardware. Overall motto has to be keep it simple. We do, we do have a tendency to uh, complicate things. Um, use multifunctionality where possible. And design with operation in mind. And that, I'm going to skip one. So test as you fly, fly as you test means that you actually test it as you will operate it, and then oper operate it as you've tested it. And I think that's very relevant to, uh, in particular, to software development. 
engineer out the failure if you can. Do a failure analysis. Where is your system going to fall over? Test the components, whether that's a software module or a power system on a spacecraft, and test the system. And test early and test hard. And by that, I mean subject it to all the extremes you're going to see. And perhaps more, more relevant for uh, follow-on development is document everything you do. Launching a spacecraft, the old joke was that in order to get a spacecraft into orbit, you had to have a pile of paper, which is equivalent to the orbital height, and you could then just push the spacecraft off into orbit off the top of the paper pile. And that's actually still true for lots of big missions, you know, space agency missions, etc. And the idea behind that is you have complete traceability, everything from the materials through to the individual components. Uh, you have all the testing regimes laid out. You have all the operational procedures fixed. What you don't do, unless you're very, very desperate, is in a spacecraft operation, is make it up as you go along. So reliability, th theme here, keep it, keep it simple. Redundancy if possible. That may not be possible if you're talking about a small spacecraft um, because you're limited by mass, volume, power, etc. And by power on a spacecraft, we're typically talking of tens of watts. So you're not talking of very uh, power-hungry systems, which means you actually tend to use uh, technology which is not necessarily fully up to date. It's a truism that everybody thinks of space technology as the latest technology. It's not. It's 10 years old. It has to be. It has to be reliable, typically. Typically 10 years old. Though people are beginning to work towards commercial off-the-shelf systems. People are beginning to fly essentially the equivalent of a mobile phone, if you like, in terms of an op operating system. And they do actually work, though there are constraints in terms of radiation, etc., and how long they'll actually last. This leads on to reconfigurable, reprogrammable systems, if, you, if possible. Um, reliable, tested, flown compo components, including software. Software has a heritage across various missions. You don't go and reinvent the software unless you really have to. Um, distributed functions. Um, this is a, a coming trend in space, is rather than putting out everything in one system, people are now talking about multiprocessor systems on spacecraft. So if you lose a processor, the whole system can redistribute itself and still function. And that's a particularly relevant in terms of either failure or radiation issues. Again, saying it again, operate using tested procedures. Lay down all the tests you want to do. Document them, program them, and run them again and again and again. Spacecraft have things called things, uh, tests like functional tests, which you constantly do time and time again. Every time you do a mechanical test on the spacecraft, you'll probably run a functional test or even an integrated system test to understand that it's still working. Understand the system and the components. And systems engineering really is the key to spacecraft and spacecraft design, and I suspect to lots of other things. Um, you want to understand the functionality. How does it actually work? And you can get caught out. On Beagle 2, for example, we got caught out in the first time we turned it on uh, in, in space because a clock um, overran and reset itself down to zero. And that caused an amazing, amazing amount of confusion as well as a, a minor crisis, which we eventually got round. Understand what the failure mechanisms are and understand what the work round recovery techniques. And as I say, I think many of these are applicable to software development, if not all of them. So what was Beagle 2? Um, it was a UK-led Mars lander. It went to Mars as part of ESA's Mars Express mission. It was led by Colin Pillinger out the OU, who sadly died a few years ago. And the project ran from 1998 to 2004 and was launched in 2nd of June 2003. 
And then when we ejected it from Mars Express for its atmospheric entry, we lost it. There was no communication with it after the 19th of December 2003. And I'm going to come back to that uh, towards the end of this talk. Now, for the software people, you'll be shocked by this. This, is, this was, in 1999, a state-of-the-art uh, uh, processor and software system, 32-bit Spark processor, radiation hard, it's silicon on sapphire, low clock speed, you know, and you'll be surprised that in actual fact the bootstrap loader was only 32 kilobytes. We don't use big software systems unless we really have to. Two software systems, there was a single string system for entry, descent and landing, and then a multitasking system for surface operations. And there were two copies of the software within the memory to protect against radiation. Software was uh, ADA plus some C, and it was all run as executable code. We could patch it, and we did actually patch the whole of the software on the way to Mars as we did more and more tests and found more and more issues as we worked our way into the details. There was image compression on board to reduce the telemetry load, use TIFFs um, plus a proprietary wavelet, and we had we tried to, if it had worked, we would have tried to send both raw and compressed images. Compressed images to start with, followed by the raw. So what does space engineering problems and engineering problems in general come down to? They come down to development problems, cost, schedule, and all can interact and feed off one another. So I'm going to start to give you some of my definitions of what I think things like innovation are. And you're obviously into innovation, uh, given, the, given this uh, conference. So what is it? It's something new, faster, or better, or cheaper. Something different. And a lot of innovation comes from thinking outside the box. We're actually connecting different boxes together. The only rules that apply in the end, apart from the fact you have to be able to afford to do it, are the laws of the universe. It may be difficult or costly, but not necessarily impossible. Ideally, something which is innovative is multi-use or new uses, minimum size, mass, or power or whatever. And the key to innovation is thinking in systems and connecting things together, things which are not necessarily um, immediately uh, come to mind as a link uh, when you think about them. Ideally, it's something strategic, not tactical, but of course, small innovation, it tends to be tactical. Ideally, it's multidisciplinary, and it requires a knowledge of both the current and future, future technologies. So pro problems with innovation, um, people don't like it because it involves change. Uh, they don't like it unless it improves things. Funding, um, lots of investment institutions and agencies tend to be conservative with a small c and you need to sustain it uh, and it needs it normally needs substantial support um, as you're all aware developing things is difficult to control costs and development time as things come out of uh, nowhere and in, in hit you ideally uh, innovation doesn't necessarily fit within procedures standards and rules and thinking outside the box, or even connecting boxes, as I'd like to think about it, uh, is key. Big thing is, big organisations, government, don't like risk. They associate innovation with risk. And to innovate, you've got to get the right team of people together. And you've got to get the right politics together. If you have an organisation, you may have to convince your upper management that in actual fact, this is the thing to do, no matter how... Um, daft it sounds or how uh, different it sounds and that was certainly the case with Beagle too. Um, it took a lot of convincing to people to actually say the UK can build a Mars lander and can go to Mars. I remember going to a meeting back in 1995-1996 when the, the initial talk was about could the UK build a lander to go on NISA's Mars Express mission. And everybody thought that Colin Pillinger was absolutely crazy. It turned out he wasn't. We did do it, and we did get it to Mars, as I'll uh, prove in a bit. 
So innovation, continuing way forward, the bottom line is go for it. If you can innovate, do it. You have to follow the vision, have the commitment, accept the risk, accept the set setbacks and ce celebrate the successes. Quite often in the UK, we don't celebrate our successes. We spend our time thinking about the setbacks and the things that went wrong. As I said previously, you need to have the convincing arguments. You need to know when you have a problem, and that problem might be either cost or, pro or progress. Um, and if you're in a team situation like we were with Beagle, at one point there were over 200 people working on the project, you have to know that team and lead that team and remember that people are actually human beings with families and lives. You can't necessarily drive people in, into the ground, though quite a few organisations sometimes try that. And there's a difference between management and leadership, which I'll come back to in a minute. Normally, you have to get new knowledge if you want to do something innovative, or you have to connect bits of knowledge and actually dig into that. And in the end, you're going to have to trust either your or your team's experience and knowledge to pull, put it off, pull it off. A lot of innovation comes about not because somebody thinks of something completely revolutionary, though it does happen, is reusing other ideas. And that might be as simple as taking a material, which we have, uh, we've, we've been using in space, and using it in a different manner. For example, we're actually developing a ventricular heart assist pump at the moment, using our space engineering techniques in collaboration with the local um, hospital. So don't be afraid of embracing, developing new technologies, but development comes with big challenges. Some, what, something which looks simple in the end may not, not be that much, not that simple. Remember, law, uh, within the laws of the universe, you may be able to do it. I'm going to show some photos of Beagle too, um, give you some idea of the com complexity of it and the innovative nature of it. And that's a human hand. So Beagle 2 was something like 300. Uh, 600 millimeters across. Uh, this is the electronics and the instrument package, which was on the end of a robotic arm. That's the onboard electronics and processor and memory chips. And this was a battery, which was lithium iron battery, um, which had all sorts of complications. It was light, it was powerful but wouldn't um, survive at low temperatures. So a lot of effort went into making a thermal design so that Beagle 2 would not die when it got to Mars. Average temperature on Mars during the day is minus 40. On a really good day, it gets up to plus 10 degrees C. And at night, it goes down to minus 120 degrees C. So you've got to have a pretty good thermal design to survive that. One of the problems we had is that because of the shock of landing on Mars, which I'll come back to, in a minute, as soon as Beagle 2 got down, essentially everything would be locked down in the base. And so we said, uh, how on earth can we get the first photo to prove we've landed on Mars? And the idea came about that we actually have a little wind sensor which pops up after landing. Didn't matter if that broke. On the bottom of that wind sen sensor, we put a mirror. And so the camera was directly under that wind sensor and could look up at the mirror and then look in all the way round, and if you unpeel that image, you can actually see the final image taken on the surface, the Earth by Beagle 2, in the clean room, spacecraft are put together under clean conditions with various engineers peering in at it. So, what's management? Um, this is my personal view. I should say all of this is my personal view, not necessarily the view of the University of Leicester who I work for. I'm sure a lot of it they would agree with. And a project is leadership. It's not accountancy. It's not uh, how, I, how I can get my promotion. Um, if you are a real good manager, 
it's team organisation, it's having a shared vision, it's following that. And that needs all sorts of um, requirements. Just listed them there, I'm not going to bother to read them, you can read them. Well, uh, everything from empathy to your members of staff, through to credibility for yourself, through to persuasiveness, you sometimes have to persuade people to do that. And you have to be open-minded. And of course, the ambition is to succeed, as I say, not necessarily to get promoted. And obviously, you need a good, good, good team. So we're all familiar with ta tasks and tools for management. Um, even if you're doing your own thing, developing your own software, you, you ought to have a plan, you ought to have a schedule, you ought to know how the work breaks down, not necessarily formally written down. You need the funding, you, need, you obviously need to meet with people, you need, and then all the other things which are listed there. I'm not going to re read through them. Um, I'll leave you, to, leave you to briefly read them as I, as I stand here. And one of the key things is to replan, and replan when you need to replan. It's no good at waiting for things to come to a complete crisis and then thinking, what the hell do I do about it? And we'll come back to risk management in a minute. But actually recognise when things are going wrong and don't be afraid that things will go wrong. Whether it's a piece of software or it's a, a spacecraft. And if necessary, sh scream for help. There's lots of people out there which will, will, will help you. And the biggest thing is communicate to your users in terms of software, customers or public, depending on what the project is. One of the great things that Colin Pillinger did was he involved the whole of the UK in Beagle 2. Everything from Blur writing a, uh, a call sign for the uh, first transmission from the surface of Mars, through to Damien Hurst actually producing a calibration target which sat on the spacecraft which had different colour paints on it so we could calibrate the cameras. But all those paints were actually different minerals as well, mineral paints, so we could actually calibrate the um, uh, mineralogy experiments as well. So how was Beagle 2 organised? Um, originally it was just a gang of us uh, who had this common vision. Uh, as I say, the first meeting I went to, I thought, this man is crazy. Second meeting I started to be convinced and I was uh, foolish enough, though in hindsight wise enough, to actually volunteer to do the project management until the prime contractor, Astrium, came along, um, who are Airbus now in Stevenage. Uh, we had an integrated team. We had lots of challenges, things that you'll all be familiar with. No, f no funding to start with. We did it in our, in our, in our spare moments. Uh, tight and fixed schedule. Mars Express was launching on 2nd of June 2003 with or without us. And the reason for that is you can only go to Mars when the planets line up, unless you have a very high... Uh, efficiency propulsion system so you have to meet that uh, deadline it's a high technology project you're all familiar with high technology um, it causes problems the thing interactions that you aren't aware of and obviously the key is a shared vision being motivated and using all possible inputs you can actually find so risk and failure and loss it happens. Um, survive it is my message. Um, retire risks early. Identify all those risks. Be honest with yourself when you're going through a development program. Where are the risks? What are they? It might be anything from people leaving a project through to the fact that uh, a piece of hardware becomes obsolete during the, during the period of the project. And replan. Don't wait for the crisis is my, my advice. Um, where you can have backups, something we did with Beagle 2, having apparently lost it in December uh, 2003, is we did our own post-mortem. So we lost it, we learnt the lessons, we had a, a number of official uh, post-mortems uh, forced on us by the European Space Agency and the British National Space Centre, 
We learnt the lessons, and those lessons have been incorporated in future projects, including the ExoMars rover, which is going to Mars in uh, 2020. And if you can, do it differently next time around. So, Beagle 2, what did it achieve? We apparently lost it uh, five days out from Mars. What it did achieve was an integrated design, it had potentially world-class and high-return science and instrumentation. It advanced lander technology in Europe, which has led to what was the Aurora program and now ExoMars. It showed that Europe could actually put a lander together. And it was a collaboration between academ academia and industry, one of the first true collaborations. And I advise that you know, people look at collaboration where they can. And certainly for big space missions, it's the only way you can actually do it. We did get it to Mars Express, only by the skin of our teeth. We delivered it at the end of January in 2003. It was going to be on a plane at the beginning of February to Russia. If we didn't make it, that was it. We flew it to Mars, we ejected it from Mars Express. And the key things that came out of it was an uh, unprecedented levels of public interest and support for planetary science. And now the UK is a key player in global planetary exploration as a result of a project which apparently failed. So I'm going to touch on what space does for us as a society briefly, just for people's information and I'll come back to uh, what happened to Beagle 2 to round up. So space and its uses, it's ubiquitous in our society. Our society today could not exist without space and space technology. Everybody thinks of space as being expensive. It is expensive but it also provides essential infrastructure now for us. So everything from communications um, through to entertainment, uh, uh, satellite broadcasting, through to weather, search and rescue rely, relies on navigation. Uh, you've seen some of the arguments perhaps in the paper about uh, should the UK and Bre after Brexit be part of Galileo. All these things interact. It provides us a way of discovering resources, monitoring and exploiting those resources and also monitoring the environment, something which is, mi is, is missing. It's beginning to become a hook for education. The big problem that the UK faces is a lack of people going into engineering, in particular people that are going into coding data analysis, exactly what you guys are interested in. And space can act as a hook. Not everybody will go, in, go into the space industry, Space industry is worth about £13 billion pounds to the UK economy, which is not bad for a government investment of £300 million. In the future, there might be power from space, and there might even be resources. People are talking about mining metals from the asteroid belt, etc. So technology development. Initially, space was a great spur for technology development here on Earth. Nowadays, consumer electronics is mainly that spur, um, but it still does happen. It affects our environment. Space weather is critical to our infrastructure. A really big flare from the sun, so-called Carrington event, would knock us back to 17th century in terms of our technology. A lot of our technology is very um, non-radiation hard. Climate change, obviously, what the sun does to us. And in the long term, life on this Earth can be affected by extraterrestrial um, issues, everything from the impacts of near-Earth objects, asteroids and comets, through to gamma-ray bursts, which are these very intense bursts which we see in the distant universe. They do occur in galaxies. If one occurred within a few tens of light years of Earth, that would be it for life on this planet, and say space weather affects communication, entertainment, navigation, and power. Stephen Hawking, who sadly passed away uh, a month or so ago, said long-term survival requires a human beings to be, human species to be more, be more than a one planet species. And that's true 
you've got hazard mitigation, you have resources out there which um, mankind could use. Um, it would not, it's not going to be easy to be out in the solar system and out in deep space. Space, as I say, is a strategic asset nowadays uh, and a necessity. It's becoming such in the UK. It wasn't the case 10 years ago. It is now. Government sees space as a growth market and actually a way of, as I say, increasing the STEM education side. So whatever your subject, UK future is in innovation and space can't, could drive innovation of our uh, instrument development, exploitation, etc. So I'm going to talk about finding Beagle 2, which we have now. A um, bit of background about myself. I work at University of Leicester. I'm director of the Space Research Centre. Um, I got involved with Beagle 2 uh, because of Colin Pillinger, but I was initially inspired to look at space as a career of our moon rocks in looking at moon rocks in Bristol in 1969. And Colin Pillinger, though he didn't know it at the time, actually showed me round the laboratory there where he was looking for carbon. And I led the Beagle 2 flight operations team and was project manager and mission manager. So Beagle 2, I'm conscious of the time, um, some of this I will skip through, was a unique opportunity at the time. Um, ESA was planning its first mission to Mars. Um, Alan Hill's meteorite in uh, 1996 came along with what was thought to be evidence of life in the past on Mars, turned out not to be or may not to be. And people were restarting and accelerating Mars exploration programs. This, by the way, is the best picture you'll get of Mars. It's a bit of a cheat. It's with the Hubble, Hubble Space Telescope. And you see this red world, thin atmosphere, blue atmosphere, polar cap, craters, volcanoes, etc. So why go to Mars and look for, look for life? Because um, we know that Mars was very much like the Earth, very early in its history. It had an ocean, it was warm, it was wet. It was a place where life could start. In terms of why the UK, um, it was true at the time, and I think it's still true today, is the UK does lots of world-leading world geochemistry work. It's got a very innovative instrument and engineering capability. And of course, it was an ideal mission to actually pull academia and industry together. And as Colin recognised very early on, high publicity and education value. So its science was quite uh, um, forward looking. Some of this has only been done in the last couple of years by. Um, uh, well, a science laboratory or curiosity look for extinct or extant life. Still, I don't have evidence of that from Mars. Uh, curiosity, science laboratory. Look at subsurface material uh, and look at first crude in situ uh, dating of rocks. I'm not going to go through the details. So Beagle 2 was this small spacecraft, um, 69 kilos, uh, just about one and a half metres across four solar panels, uh, high payload fraction, highly integrated, no, no redundancy. Landed configuration was this splayed out thing and it was like a watch. It sort of opened itself up. And landed via entry shield, pilot chute, main chute and then airbags. Dropped out of those airbags onto the surface of Mars, we hoped. And in project history, I'm going to very briefly um, talk about this. 1997 Royal Society meeting leading through to 1999, a industrially backed project and a government backed project leading through to 20th of January 2003 when we actually closed the lid on the lander. By the way, these are pictures from Curiosity showing landscapes on Mars. Uh, we delivered it to the launch site, we launched it and we uh, flew it to Mars and we tested it on the way to Mars and it should have landed on the Christmas day 2003 and then followed by following on from ejection from Mars Express on the 19th of December 
We'd never heard from it, but we did find Beagle. It was found in November 2014, and we announced it at a press conference in 15. And that's the last photo we had on the 19th of December 2003 with Beagle 2 spinning off into the darkness. Now I'm going to skip that. So what are you looking for? You're looking for something very, very small. I mean, it's less than the size of this table on the surface of Mars. Lots of different colours, everything from gold through to burnt aeroshell, through to white parachutes, through to tan-coloured airbags, um, which is not the greatest thing to look, up, look for on Mars. Um, in 2006, a uh, mission called Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter got to Mars with a high-resolution telescope called HiRISE, which has 30 centimetre per pixel resolution, and we, st we and other people started to request um, images across the uh, landing zone of Beagle 2. This is where it's calculated it could land. And that's actually a 6 by 15 uh, kilometre um, area. Beagle 2 is a metre and a half across, a bit like uh, tr trying, to, uh, trying to find a paper clip having chucked it into a... a pile of straw perhaps um, and essentially you're looking for something very very small not too sure exactly where it is but Michael Croon who was actually part of the Mars Express op op operations team found in two of these images an object and when he flipped between the two images the object was still there skip that and this is, if you like, one of the discovery images. You actually have a dot, which is a parachute. You have a little dot up here, which looks like Beagle 2. It was entering this way. And you have what looks like the rear, rear cover down the bottom. This is a slightly different view. This was done in, in association with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the University of Arizona, which own the camera. And you see these little little dots here. What makes you think that's Beagle 2 and its, air, its cover? And the answer is this. Tim Parker at JPL put together all the different images we had. And when you looked at it, you had this thing which looked like a bit like Mickey Mouse, sat on the surface of Mars of the right size to actually be Beagle 2 with some of its solar panels sticking out the side. More recently, we've taken super resolution techniques, which you're familiar with from image processes, I'm sure of that, and actually reprocess this data. And you can actually see parachute, Beagle 2, its heat shield, and its pilot chute and rear cover. So why do we think it is? It's the right colors, it's in the right place, the right separation, right sequence in terms of where it is across the landscape and the number of discrete elements, and it's the right height. And in actual fact, there's a glint effect, which I'll come to in a minute, because that's key to actually identifying what state Beagle 2 is in. So we see a lander, we see a rear cover, we see a parachute, we don't see the airbags, not too surprising, they're tan colored, but we do see the front shield. So even when you think you've lost something, you may find it again. Uh, this is a Close-up image, this is as good as you get. Remember, it's 30 centimetres per pixel. This is uh, two pixels across, a bit less than two pixels across. And you can sort of match Beagle 2 to a combination of its base, its lid, and one or two solar panels. So what do we have? Well, we had, it's probably partially deployed, it's probably opened, maybe a number of panels are de uh, deployed what can we do? So what we, I came up with this idea of so-called reflection analysis. In that you've got flat surfaces, shiny flat surfaces, so you're going to get glint. So if you could actually make a virtual model of Beagle 2, put it on the surface of Mars, and adjust the lighting, etc., so it's the same as we see from orbit, maybe you can match a virtual model with the real thing. We did, did this with uh, De Montfort University... Theodora, Nick, etc. And this is what we got. So this is a simulated image. 
This is the rendered image. This is the actual image. When you actually look at the uh, rendered image in the real image, you can actually see some kind of match. It's not a perfect match. If you look at all the different images we've got, you end up with this kind of configuration of Beagle 2 on the surface. It's pointing that way, and it's at a very slight angle with respect to the surface. And you can do the same with the rear heat shield. So what does it mean? Beagle 2 isn't lost, it's on Mars, so something which we thought failed has, did actually survive to the surface uh, of the planet. So is it success, is it a failure? I'll leave you to read this. My, my personal comment is it was a success, it was a success even though it failed at the time. It's more of a success now. In it, Beagle 2 is on the surface of Mars and the UK were the first people outside the states of Russia to actually put a lander on the surface of Mars. Bad news is it never communicated with us. And the reason for that is the radio antenna was buried under the solar panels. So if all the solar panels didn't open, we wouldn't be able to communicate with it. So and that was forced on us by the configuration we had to adopt in order to fit the uh, payload constraints. So that's a lesson for everybody is be aware of what, how, what, how constraints are driving you, whether it's software, hardware, or whatever engineering project. Sometimes those constraints can come back to bite you and actually cause a, a failure. So I've rushed through some of that towards the end. I've consciously done that so there's a bit of time for questions, if there are any questions. Um, but try and re remember that innovation comes with risk. And risk, to a certain extent, you can engineer out, but not totally. Sometimes things come out left field, which will bite you hard and uh, involve, as in terms of Beagle 2, an apparent failure as far as uh, authorities were concerned. Practically, in the end, Beagle 2 was shown to be a success. It's just annoying it could be sat on the surface of Mars, collecting data, and we will never get that data. So, final slide is to thank all the people which were involved in finding Beagle 2, uh, particularly uh, the MRO team, the Mars Reconnaissance team, and the University of Arizona High Rise team, and all the other people which are listed there. And in particular, Michael Kroon. Without him, we would have never found it. And of course, Colin Pillinger, who started the idea, and his wife Judith, who survives him today. So, thank you very much. I see I've got seven minutes left. So, if there are any questions, I will try and try and take them. I don't promise to be able to answer them. So, the gentleman on the front row. No, the. The software was written by industry. A lot of the functionality of some of the modules, in particular some of the instrumentation stuff, was defined by academia. And the test team was a combination of both. So if we took an instrument, we plugged it into the computer, we, the academics were there at the same time as the, the engineers. But it was written in ADA, it was written to be robust software. In actual fact, as I say, there were two software systems. It's a single string system during entry and descent, and all these critical operations. And then it turned into a multitasking system on landing. In actual fact, the whole thing shut itself down and rebooted into the alternate software system, which obviously worked because it deployed the solar panels or deployed some of the solar panels. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a long time ago. This happened back in uh, sort of July 2003, which is uh, 15 years ago. But essentially, the whole of the spacecraft is, is controlled by a clock, like a lot of systems. And that clock will roll over at some point and reset itself back to zero. And we would, the first time we turned Beagle 2 on, 
We'd done so much testing on the ground that we hadn't realised that the clock was close to rolling over. And when it rolled over, it meant that the software, software didn't recognise the times we were sending in terms of commands to actually um, talk to Beagle 2. So essentially we ended up being locked out the whole system until we realised that the clock had rolled over and then we could reset the command protocol so that we could actually then talk to it. We had four or five hours of frantic, what the hell do we do? We've got a spacecraft on the way to Mars, we've turned it on. We can't do anything with it at the moment because the clock has rolled over and the command software is not, not recognising the uh, commands we're sending it. So it's, it's, it's an issue. Be aware of things which may come out of left field and bite you. Nobody had actually even thought of that as an issue. Got one up over there. Sorry, I can't see because of the lights. Yeah. With the um, software being written by a different team outsourced to the industry, when that had to be then integrated with hardware and testing, did you find that that was the easy process to get that integration right the first time before the first time? The Beagle 2 is very much an integrated team. So the software developers were talking constantly to the people building the hardware. And that was the key to Beagle 2, is to get everybody working together, not go off to your company, write a piece of code, stick it on the process, so no, oh my God, it doesn't work. So it was a constant interaction, and in some cases, software developers went and relocated to Astrium or Airbus in order to do development on site, so there were no uh, misunderstandings. I mean, there were problems with the software, um, you know, we did build modules which didn't talk, didn't work. But it was a set of people who are familiar with spacecraft software. Spacecraft software has a particular way of being, being written. Um, so it is robust. And everything is done in terms of modular uh, chunks of software. So that you've not got this vast piece of software where if you change something, it falls over. Everything is a distinct module and you test that module on its own. Software development, as you're all well aware, is not an easy task. Um, it's even less easy in something like this. So there's another question somewhere. I have one last silly question. Go on. So you ask Elon Musk, but when he gets there, can you have your people back? <laughs> <laughs> it's not such a silly question in actual fact. Um, the issue with going and finding Beagle 2 is one, being able to land close enough, which Elon might be able to. Um, the second thing is, is it the place people want to go to? The landing site was selected to be an area which had had water three to four billion years ago, had the right geochemistry, where there may have, may have been evidence of life. There's no guarantee you could pick a spot here on Earth where you'd be hard put to find evidence of life. Um, so yeah, in principle, um, you know, you can imagine a scenario, probably not within my lifetime, of somebody going in, finding Beagle, and uh, it becoming an antiquity site on Mars or something like that, or even, even bringing it back. I mean, it would be nice to see if it was still working and we, we constantly have thoughts about how we could actually communicate with Beagle, despite the fact that one of the panels may not be fully open. But that does actually require cooperation from the agencies in, who have spacecraft in orbit around Mars, which could communicate with Beagle too. And for very obvious reasons, they have their own priorities. They have half a billion to billion dollar missions on the surface of Mars, so looking for one lost lander on Mars is not at the top of their priority list. But yeah, in principle you could land, find Beagle 2. I suspect it won't happen. Might happen in the distant future if uh, human beings go to Mars and survive long enough to go to Mars. Yeah? Hi. I have a question about Damien Hurst. Ah, right. <laughs> How much did he charge? Nothing. Nothing? Absolutely nothing. Wow. 
if you want to fund a mission to Mars to go find a Damien Hirst painting, it's the only painting actually on Mars. So, uh, yeah, no, a lot of people bought into Beagle 2 on the basis that it was free publicity. It's publicity you can't buy. So Damien and Blur were the two big examples, but lots of other people, including team members, provided their own free time and stuff like that in order to get Beagle 2 to launch pad as we know now, actually onto the surface of Mars. So yeah, it's probably worth a bit, that painting, if you could go fetch it. The you know, <laughs> price of fetching it is a lot more than it's worth, though, of course. Any other questions? So, sorry, I can't quite hear you. No, it's actually a lot easier. Um, UK has actually realised that space is a strategic um, asset. It needs to be in space. And funding for space has actually increased no end in the UK over the last decade or more, particularly since UK has had, now has a, a space agency, UK Space Agency. And that came about because of an exercise called the Innovation for Growth Strategy, which I was part of back in... 2008 through to 2010, which made the economic case to the government on why space is important. And I, I would say, at the moment, I think the last set of figures I saw was the space economy is worth about 13.5 billion to the UK economy, for which the UK government puts in 300 million, most of which goes to be membership of the European Space Agency which won't stop after Brexit before anybody thinks that because the uh, European Space Agency is separate from the EU. So, yeah, it's easier. Whether you could fund Beagle 2 is a different question. Probably still would be difficult. It wasn't cheap to do, um, especially, with, especially estimating costs for something which is new, as you all well know, is very difficult. We estimated the cost of Beagle 2 at about... 10 million. In the end, it prob nobody knows the exact bill because people put in time for free, etc. It, um, it's probably about 40 to 50 million. So, factor of, four, factor of four probably isn't too bad for a high technology project. You look at other projects which the UK have done, which uh, have similar factors in terms of what the guess was and what reality was. So, yeah, you, you could do it. The idea originally was to get somebody to sponsor Beagle 2 and actually pay for it. But unfortunately, innovation equals risk. And lots of companies want a guarantee if they're going to put in money to something like this. OK, time's up, I see, on the screen. So uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions? <laughs>